Hard Talk is in Cairo to assess the state of Egypt's post-revolutionary politics. And right now, the report card is decidedly mixed. Yes, Egypt does have a democratically elected president. But arguments over the framing of a new constitution have sparked clashes between Islamist and secular activists right here in Tahrir Square. My guest today is Egypt's Prime Minister, Hisham Kandil. Is the country's new government living up to the promise of the Tahrir Revolution? Prime Minister Hisham Kandil, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Welcome to Cairo, Egypt. Thank you. Your government has a huge task to try and bring this country together after more than 18 months of, of violence and upheaval. Is it fair to say that the task is proving even more difficult than you imagined? Well, the task, the task is difficult. That's a good description for But I don't think it's impossible. That's why we, are take, we have taken this task. You know, the Egyptians, I think they surprised the world. When, when they stood in Tahrir squares and other major squares in Egypt. And in just 18 days, they overthrown a tyrant that uh, a lot of people uh, thought that they would never go. So uh, after that, we had some uh, uh, painful, as you say, uh, transitional period. But I think this was, uh, was uh, transformed completely when, uh, when we have now the, 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 uh, the first uh, civilian, for the first time in the, Egyptian, in the modern Egyptian history, a civilian president that was elected, freely elected, and the army uh, transformed power in a peaceful way. And we have an elected, we have now a, an accountant government that in charge of the business here. But uh, you mentioned the election of President Morsi, and of course it was an historic landmark for this it country. Is, but is. at the time of his election, he made promises, he made pledges, some of which he said he could deliver within 100 days on the economy, on security, on everything, including garbage collection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the truth is, if you look at that raft of promises, most of them have not been met. No, it depends how you define them, of course. If you think that uh, one can solve the problem that has accumulated for, the, for decades, in, in 100 days, I don't think is, uh, is, is the right thing to, to, to do. But the way he promised, it, promised them is to, is to make significant change. And let me name one, which is security. Uh, security has changed tremendously. Uh, it, is, it, was, it was not easy. It was, it was not easy to walk in the streets. A lot of cars were stolen. Uh, people were afraid to, to travel on, on roads between cities. Things have changed tremendously especially in security. And other things have now, improved. Did you talk to people outside this rather grand office? Because I've spoken to many Egyptians who say that security is still a tremendous problem and the, the relationship between the people and the security forces in this country remains extremely difficult. No, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is the nature. Well, we are, we're, we are beginning our democracy journey, as everybody knows. And part of the democracy journey is that you allow for... Uh, the opinion and the opposite opinion. And uh, nowadays, it is, uh, it, is, uh, <laughs> it is fashionable to attack the government. So whatever you do is still, uh, is still not satisfying. But I, I tell you from record, from, from KPI, that uh, security has improved tremendously. You talk about the way in which people criticize the government. Something really rather extraordinary happened on October 12th, just a few weeks ago here in the center of Cairo. Not 10 minutes from this office, mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of people gathered, people who regard themselves as the revolutionaries of Tahrir. Mm -hmm. And this time they were protesting not about the Mubarak regime, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. gone, not about the armed forces and the SCAF regime, which is gone, but they were directly protesting about the failings of the Morsi government, your government, and they demanded that you begin to meet the promises you made, because they feel you're not. Okay, but I mean, uh, usually when people are elected, they're given uh, months to present their program, and maybe after three months they can give a progress report on uh, or a, a accounts of what they have done within the last three months. It, it doesn't happen that after one month, I mean, I, I received of course, maybe they were sarcastic emails saying, you have been in power for 15, 15 minutes. What have you done for us? And I mean, people, people have 
seriously. They, you know, they want the results and they want it now. The problem but is... Prime Minister, my point isn't really that, that criticism shouldn't be expected. Of course it should. My yeah. point is more that in response to that turnout of thousands of protesters in Tahrir Square, what did we see? We saw violence. We saw many protesters injured. We, see, we saw hundreds of them detained. And we saw President Morsi accuse these protesters of being counter-revolutionaries who had been paid to be there. That was the language that President Mubarak used I, to use. I have not heard President Morsi saying that people were paid to be in Tahrir Square. That was my word, a different event. When others were attacking the, uh, the, the, the embassy, the US embassy, after this uh, um, movie came out, uh, I, I, that was, I know that, that was, but I think if you look was, at the record, you yeah. will find that President Morsi said that some of those people there on October 12th had been paid to go and protest against what I'm his saying, government. Well, I'm, and I'm, I'm confirming that in, 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 many, in many demonstrations, some are being paid. Who, who's paying them? Well, this is something we need to find out, but we, you know, we, we're working on it. But this is the kind of conspiracy theory that the Mubarak people used to peddle. I'm not saying a conspiracy theory, I mean, a theory here. I'm, I'm talking about facts. This is to start with. And I'm talking about a small number of people. I'm not saying that was, there were some people there out, out there, you know, demonstrating against that they want, uh, they want, they want to see what they came, the, the revolution is all about. Uh, bread, uh, you know, uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, freedom and, and, and social justice. But it just that uh, the problem, as I mentioned, is that, you know, they, they start counting from January 25. So they want, they are right, you know, they have been in this transitional period for so long. Many of them are being tired. They want their jobs, they want their freedom, they want their bread, they want their social justice now, because now it has been since January 25th, 5th last year. But we have not empowered, been empowered since then. But are you saying that you lack the means to deliver the jobs, the economic growth, the prosperity, that people outside this office are so desperate to no, see. No, no, of course I'm lacking a magic stick. Of course, that's is, this is, I, I confess. But we have the program and we have the means to deliver on re the results on the ground. And we are delivering. Perhaps the most serious single question facing Egypt today is the question of the Constitution and mm -hmm. defining the character of the new Egypt. And many of the demonstrators who've been in Tahrir, in Tahrir Square in recent weeks are either secularists who fear that the new constitution is going to be essentially an Islamic constitution, or mm -hmm. Salafi Muslim Islamists mm -hmm. who are determined to see full Sharia law implemented. Where do you stand on this? Well, first of all, the government does not intervene in the constitution writing. You know, this is, this is the constitution assembly is role and they are doing their job. So, and they put out the first draft. And look historically how constitutions in Egypt were put together. Two or three people sit together and they put the constitution and the president might have his own other constitution in the cabinet and, and they will pull it out and this is the constitution that goes for referendum. Now it's different. We have an assembly of 100 people you know, getting people from everywhere, and, and their discussion, the way you're describing, I think is very healthy, and they're going to reach a consensus. I'm very confident on that. But the Constituent Assembly is not representative. For example, how many women are on the Constituent well, Assembly? I don't, I don't know. Seven out of a hundred. Seven. Is yes. that acceptable? No, it is not about number. I mean, again, number counts when you come to vote. But it doesn't mean one good representative for women can do miracle. But the thing is, the text there, do they represent women, do they reflect their ideas or not? That's the, that's the most important thing. It's a, that's not about number. And what about this? Um, when it comes to gender equality, mm -hmm. the articles, relevant articles in the draft that we have seen of this constitution talk about the commitment to equality between men and women, but only within the context mm -hmm. of the judgments of Islamic Sharia. Does that make sense to you? Well, uh, you know, I have five daughters myself. And I know very well about, uh, I'm a minority myself in, in the house and when it comes to women and, and, and men. But this is a side thing. I, I, I wanted to tell you that uh, uh, the draft is a draft for discussion and for people to fix it and adjust it. So it becomes a final thing. So as, as long as it's not a final thing, uh, you know, it's still a draft that people are working on. So you have five daughters. Do you want your daughters to live in an Egypt where Islamic scholars can declare, for example, that female circumcision, or as its opponents call it, 
female genital mutilation mm -hmm. can be legal in this country. Do you want to live in an Egypt where women can, in different circumstances, face abuse in the home from their husbands and have it declared not a crime under Sharia law? Do you want to live in an Egypt where women's right to travel independently could be restricted by their menfolk? Well, yeah, I think you, you, uh, you, know, you brought a lot of, uh, uh, how do you call it, a lot of rumors, a lot of uh, uh, faulty things, and you, you stick them to, to, to Sharia. Sharia doesn't talk about all these things. I mean, I can add to them. One, one uh, rumor spread around about that we, we you know, that uh, the, the Constitution calls for uh, decreasing the marriage age of women to nine. You know, it's <laughs> so a lot of rumors about that. So I, 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 as, as I mentioned to you, you know, this is a draft constitution and let us, let us make it good. And this is, this is we're, we're, draw, we're drawing the future for us. Let, let, let me ask you just a very simple question, Prime Minister. You are not officially affiliated to any party. You're not a member of the Muslim oh, yes. Brotherhood. Yes. But nonetheless, because of the office you hold, Egyptians want to know an answer to a very simple question. At the end of the constitutional process, do you believe Egypt will be left with a constitution which is more Islamic, adheres more closely to Sharia mm -hmm. than it did in the past? I think, okay, I think in the past we adhered to Sharia with a, with a high percent. I'm not sure how much is a percent, uh, 90 percent, 95 percent. What, what, what I want to, you know, as, as people, uh, on the seat, as one person in the seat now. I think what it counts is what do we do with this constitution? How do we apply it on the ground? I think it is not, it's not the constitution only that will bring us forward. It is how are you going to fight poverty? How are we going to go about education? How are we going to treat women? How are we going to treat you know, you know, the, the, the marginalized areas? This is the most important thing in my, point, my view as a prime minister on the ground that I have a feeling and a knowledge of what's happening in this and, country. And when you talk about women and gender issues, does it give you pause when very influential women activists in this country, and I'm thinking, for example, of Hebba Marayef from Human Rights Watch in this country, when they say things like this, it is clear the official policy in this country is becoming there will be no equality, no equality between men and women. Equality in what? I mean, you know, I'll give an example of what, what is our policy and what is, you know, when we talk about economic policy, for instance, my concern is, is to target the poor and the poorest areas. So if you want to, if you look at this, the, the unemployment rate, it's the highest among people in the southern of Egypt, and it's, high, it's four times in women when it comes to, compared to male. So we want to encourage sectors, for instance, the textile sectors, that can really give jobs to the poorest, people, the poorest area, to the poorest group being women. So women and the poor, you know, it comes in the top priority in our policy. I want to reflect on some other um, elements of the transition from the old <coughs> Mubarak regime to your new government. And I, I want to think maybe about the role of the army, the military in Egyptian life. Seems to me there is a very gray area at the moment where it is too sensitive to discuss in detail how the civilian power will relate to the military power in the new Egypt, and in particular, who will hold the purse strings uh, that define the military budget. Can you tell me whether you, as civilian prime minister, will in the future absolutely control the military budget? Well, you have to wait to the constitution. I mean, uh, <laughs> this is something that you, uh, I'm not uh, a fortune reader. I have to wait for the constitution because I'm within my... Sure, but you make it sound as though absolutely everything is possible, as though it's possible that the military could continue to run their own budget. Surely no, in the uh, new what, Egypt what that I, cannot be possible. What, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is being drafted next door, literally next door. But this is being discussed by civilians. Of course, there is a military representative there, but uh, I think they are presented by one out of a hundred. So in those, this discussion will, will reveal exactly the role and... Uh, what, what do you believe the balance should be? Well, the balance of power between the civil and military authority? Well, definitely the, the, you know, the, the, the government and, and the president will have control on, uh, on the expenditure of the army. This is, this is clear and it will happen, and I don't think any objection to that. 
with some security about sensitive uh, deals that the arm deals that uh, that it has to be kept secret for a small group of people now there are people who look at for example the failure of this government to pursue legal action against very senior military officers who ran the Supreme Council uh, during the post Mubarak period and they suggest that that reflects a, a fear amongst you in the civilian government to go after for example Field Marshal Tantawi and others held or accused of responsibility for the deaths of a large number of Egyptians. Well I just wanted to tell you one thing is nobody's above the law in this country and Mubarak is in jail. And Mubarak, you know, when, uh, when President Morsi was sworn in uh, in, uh, in the Supreme Court in Maadi area, next door, and I'm sure Mubarak at that time heard the siren of his old cars with a new president coming to, you know, to swear in for the new presidency. So I tell you, nobody's above the law in this country. What about Tantawi? Nobody's above the law, that's, that's the answer. Should Tantawi be worried that ultimately he will face justice for decisions he took no, what, during what I'm, the... what I'm saying, what I'm saying, I, I, think, I think the army has done what it can during this transition period. It just, this is unprecedented. What we have been through is unprecedented. And I think they have done, um, uh, you, know, you know, a lot of, you know, they, had, they, they faced a hell of a task during this transition period. See, Joe Stork of, of Human Rights Watch Middle East says, for the past year and a half, the military in this country has been getting away with murder, with torture, with sexual assault, because military investigators are unwilling to seriously investigate their own. So can you tell me that the civil jurisdiction will now take on investigation of the security forces? No, uh, well, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to say is that uh, civilian investigators, they do the job, they're investigating everybody in this country, and we respect... Uh, but they're not investigating the military, are they? Because the military courts, the military uh, jurisdiction is still responsible for cases involving well, the army. This is the law right now. If it changes, then... Should it, it change? Well, this is the Constitution Assembly. Well, Constitution Assembly would decide that. It just seems to me every answer you give me about, well, this is up in the air, this all goes before the Constitu Constituent Assembly, it leaves this country in limbo. No, why, why are you saying that? Because well, for a start, you don't, you don't even have, this right now, you don't even have a parliament. Here you sit, a, a senior member of the executive, mm -hmm. there is lo, no legislative in this country right the now. The parliament power, has been dissolved. Yeah, the legislative power is with the president. And it's just that the nature of some of your questions that, uh, I, you know, there is no answer for them at this point of time. So if you ask different questions, I might give you the answers. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's worrying, is it not? That there is no answer because the truth is the political system right now is dysfunctional. You no, don't no, have a parliament. No, you well, have an executive which is the only... You, there's no answer for the specific questions that you asked, maybe. Some of them I hope I answered to you satisfactory. But uh, maybe if other questions I'll be able to answer. Consider the fact that recently Israel's Vice Premier Moshe Yalon called Sinai a lawless territory, his phrase, not mine. And when you <coughs> consider that in recent days your own security forces have found a cache of weapons and jihadi militants in Nasser City, not far from Cairo, mm -hmm. when you had a shootout in the heart of Cairo, which appears to have killed a suspect involved in the, in the assassination of the U.S. ambassador in Benghazi, there's a feeling that mm -hmm. there is a danger of a rise of jihadi militancy in Egypt, which your government is not controlling. Well, I, I, you know, I, you know, I was in Algeria a few weeks ago, and I talked to the prime minister in there, and we chat. We chatted about uh, what's happening in, in in Libya, and what's happening in Mali, and the connection between them. And of course, we we we're being alerted, and uh, about what's happening there. And what happened? May I just interrupt? Do, do you believe there is a danger that that militants in other countries, some neighbours and some a little further mm -hmm. away? are looking at Egypt and are beginning to think that they can infiltrate and use Egypt. Now what I'm trying to say is that uh, our security forces are very much alert and uh, it was not something by coincidence they were following those people and they when they raid you know that building they know what's in there and they, they dealt with it. and I would like to see this as a very good professional uh, operation that they did that should be praised for, for first for their intelligence and then their intervention with not 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 to the other way around
to look at uh, this is danger and this is uncontrolled. And that, no, it is in the country. They, they managed, they had the knowledge, they have the information and intelligence, and at the proper time, they, they raid the building, and uh, except for the guy there, nobody was injured. But that, that is just one case, but I just wonder whether you believe there is, right now, a real th threat to Egypt's no, security from no, international what I, what jihadi saying, terror. No, what I'm saying is our security people are in full control. And we, we're dealing uh, actively with our neighboring country exchanging information. And of course, in each country there is here and there, but we have to be alert and we watch this and, and we are in control. I think it's fair to say that when you talk of neighbors, one neighbor that wants plenty of reassurance right now is Israel. And I just wonder, your, your government, President Morsi, and I, I believe yourself too, you've made it plain that you intend to fully abide by the peace treaty with mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. But what we've heard from the Israelis is that they would like signals of, a, of, a, of a, a determination to engage with them. They would like to see senior Egyptian officials meeting with senior Israelis, both mm -hmm. in Egypt and in Israel. Simple question, would you be prepared to travel to Israel to talk no, to your I, counterpart? I, I, would, I would do what it takes to bring peace to this region. And this is, the cons this is what, uh, this is what we, uh, we're determined to do. We want to support uh, all parties to come, to come together uh, and talk. Now we have... Are you prepared to go to Israel to talk to your counterpart? What I'm saying is we, we are prepared to do whatever it takes to bring peace to this region. And I'm telling you that Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman said the other day, peace can't just be theor theoretical. He said senior officials from my country need to sit down with senior officials from Egypt. I would like to invite the Egyptians to Jerusalem. So will you go? Well, well you know, the, the Palestinian issue is the core thing. And uh, what's happening in the region there, you know, is, is you know, right now there's, there's a golden opportunity, I think, after the presidential election from the U.S. Uh, then, then, because there's a peace in the region, you know, there's a quiet thing. Not the, I will not call it a peace. And uh, we can... Well, we, you wouldn't call it a peace? No. With what, Israel? What would you call it then? No, I'm not talking about Egypt and Israel. I'm talking about uh, the Hamas group in, uh, in, in, in Gaza. I'm talking about the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. You know, this is not, an, this is not a long-lasting peace. What, what is there, you know, it is that's quiet. You know, but we're waiting for the next eruption. But now, as it is quiet, it's an opportun opportunity that to bring the Palestinians together and start a negotiation process. That will bring an everlasting peace to the region. A final thought, Prime Minister. You, throughout this interview, have, have not hidden the fact that it is difficult. The task this government faces is tough. You've got big challenges. How long should the Egyptian people expect to have to wait before you start to turn this country around? Well, we identified uh, tasks and jobs that we, we have started uh, doing since we assumed responsibility on August 2nd. This will continue until the end of this year. And this will focus on low-hanging fruits, like tourism, like uh, industry, like agriculture areas, like uh, creating new jobs, but about fixing the economy, fixing the financial system and the economic system. This will start very soon and will continue until maybe the end of the fiscal year, uh, June 2014. So this year we expect 3% economic growth. The next year we expect I'm sorry, this year we expect 4% economic growth. The following year will be probably 5%. And after that, we will see you know, the country really going, going on the rise. If you can hold it together, if you can maintain some sort of unity between all these different forces we've discussed in this interview. No, no, we, we, I have no doubt about that. No doubt at all? No doubt. Otherwise, I won't be in this position. Prime Minister Hisham Kandil, thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pleasure. Prime Minister. Pleasure. It is much appreciated.